Attorney knows best. Intelligent interviews. Interesting insight. Intriguing information. Attorney knows best. Here's your host, Sean Bartley. Welcome to another episode of Attorney Knows Best. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with restaurateur and entrepreneur, John Paul D'Amato. John Paul began his career in the restaurant business with his family, slowly working his way up to be owner and operator of several restaurants. Today, I'm talking to John Paul to get his knowledge and experience and hope that it will inspire you to be a chef and or Go to a restaurant and appreciate the art and craft of cooking. Hey, John Paul, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Um, how are you surviving these COVID-19 times? I ask everybody that. I think it's important to know. Oh, absolutely. I think everybody should feel free to talk about it as well. It's good, it's good energy to release. Um, you know, I see opportunity. That's all you can that's all I can think, at least. I, I, it's terrible. Um, look what it's done to everything and everybody, especially the hospitality industry. But at the same time, you can't sit there and just wait. You have to recreate. And um, I think a lot of the people I'm close to are doing that, and um, as well as myself. How are you surviving? What's what's going on with you in the hospitality industry and COVID-19, has it negatively affected or impacted you? Absolutely. It basically took away my career, Mm -hmm. um, where I was going um, in it. Uh, I was a culinary director for a small hotel group, and I was trying to expand that part of my profession. And now that COVID hit, uh, a lot of that's going to go away, and I think things are going to be a lot more simplified in the hospitality sector. And, and, and I mean that from hotels to restaurants to retail and fast food, all of it. Um, it's just going to change a lot. A lot of people, uh, a lot of companies that had um, corporate jobs and stuff like that, they're going to scale that back a lot. Um, they're just going to take away a lot of the non-essential stuff that really doesn't make them the money. And I think that's it's going to change the industry a lot. Like we were blowing up big time for the best. And now I think it, everyone's just going to, you know, pull it back a little bit and recreate and try not to lose everything. When and, you say when you say pull it back a little bit, what do you mean? Not being extravagant in their ingredients, their cookings or, uh, or- I, I mean it towards growing, um, to be honest with you. A lot of restaurants today want to do one or two or three or four different concepts, and they also want to expand in different cities and capitalize where other people aren't. I think people will pull back now and just keep it as local as possible, or you know what I mean? I mean, so not expand their restaurants and have have multiple locations. Yeah, I think I think that's going to be less. Um, I, I may be totally wrong, but. Um, what I'm seeing, um, I don't think so. I, I think people are just going to hold on to the most important pieces in their companies and focus and expand those those properties more. Um, especially now that we see a lot of people are into the the takeout and takeouts come. Uh, it's really completely different than it was before COVID. So you know, um, yeah. Um, let's talk about your experience in the restaurant industry and why your insight in the restaurant industry is important and why, um, what you're saying about the future is going to, might unfold. How'd you get started in the restaurant industry, Paul, John Paul? Accidentally. I was a welder. (laughs) Um, I went to vocational school through high school, uh, my last two years of high school, and I became a, a welder. I was um, a certified ARC MIG and TIG welder. And I, I, I moved to D.C. from northern New Jersey. And my family, uh, I had two brothers and a sister that lived in D.C. at the time. This is back in the 1981, 82. Mm-hmm. And I just used to do laundry at their restaurant because they had 
a killer laundry uh, uh, room underneath the restaurant. They had real rollers. They did all their own laundry. So what, they didn't send. So your sorry. parents had a restaurant. What was the name of the restaurant? No, my two brothers. Oh, your two brothers uh, had a restaurant. Okay. Yeah, it was called Restaurant Nora on the corner of Florida and R and Dupont Circle in DC. It was there? Yeah, it was there for thirty-eight years. They retired it in twenty seventeen. Okay. First certified organic restaurant in the world. Cafe Nora. Restaurant Nora. Restaurant Nora. And you started in that restaurant with your brothers working in the laundry. Why is laundry important in a restaurant? I wouldn't think they would have a laundry facility. Well, because they, you know, they're, they focus on sustainability and, and, and being as pure as possible. And for them, they just felt like doing the laundry with the right kind of cleaning solutions that won't harm you and all their fabrics are organic um, they didn't, we didn't have a linen service. They, we were the linen service. So I used to kind of do my laundry, go upstairs in the kitchen, hang out. They would put me to work right away. Like my sister-in-law would throw me right in there and be like, go ahead make pasta. We need pasta. I need you to make this type of pasta. This is how you do it and do it. I'm like, okay. And I would just do it. And I found myself really liking it. And they just asked me one day, do you want to come and work here? And uh, I was like, yeah, because I was 19 and I, being a welder wasn't that. Uh, I did it more in school for art. I wanted to make art. I didn't really want to be a welder. You mm-hmm. know, um, I just wanted to learn how to do it, to create art. And I realized, oh, I'm not that kind of a blue collar guy. <laughs> you know, so um <laughs> I was hanging out in their kitchen a lot, and they just asked me, and I was like, yeah, I'll make the career change. I was 19, no big deal. And Um, so your your brothers, were they trained chefs? Absolutely not. They didn't even cook. Um, One came, one was uh, in the Dominican Republic in the Peace Corps for like eight years helping small businesses and families, um, you know, helping them out and creating better uh, avenues for them. And then he came back uh, to America, and he was staying with my brother and his girlfriend, Nora, and they were both working at the Tabard Inn in DuPont Circle. And Nora was the chef, and my my other brother was the GM of the the tiny little inn. And they wanted to open a restaurant. And when my brother came back from the DR, they just started talking and be like, look, you can do the financial part. I'll be like the head of the whole group. My other brother said this, and then Nora would be the chef. And they had a really interesting investor. His name was Ben Bradley. I think you guys know who Ben Bradley is. He was the owner of the Washington Post. And he invested in them. And, you know, um, and then it just took off. They have a lot of history in D.C. because it was really them and Jean-Louis Paladin from uh, the Watergate Hotel. Um, and those were really the only restaurants to speak about in D.C. back in the very early 80s. So, and so you started working there making pasta, doing laundry room to pasta making. And goat curry. And those goat are the curry. first things I've ever made. Okay. And so how did you progress at uh, Restaurant Nora? I, you know, good question. Because my two brothers just threw me in areas just – to help them out. And I I realized, wow, I'm ordering food from farmers. I'm expediting the tickets on the line at night, but I really don't know how to cook. And I I came up to him one day. I'm like, I don't think the cooks like me, man, because I'm doing all these other jobs where I think they would want them. And I need to learn how to cook. And they're like, Hey, yeah, good point. So they just threw me on the line and I just learned I worked for them for about four years, and then I opened their second restaurant, which was called City Cafe, and then it turned into Asian Nora. But I I realized I needed to to really learn because I really – I felt like I'm pretty good at this. So I moved back to New York. Wait, wait. So you were – it was like a baptism by fire on the cook line. Yeah. Wow. And I I realized I'm not that good. I need to be technically better. And what made me think that was one of the line cooks came from some other restaurant and I was watching him and he was amazing. 
And I was like, I got to learn how to cook like that. But that's natural instinct. And he said, you, you need to just go look for chefs that you like and go work for them. So that's what I did. I handpicked a bunch of chefs in New York. I literally went up to the door and handed them my resume and kept my fingers crossed. And I, that's how I did it. For about two years, I did that. And then I, I hunkered down and I, I, I picked somebody I really wanted to work for. And I worked for that person for a few years. What was that person's really, name? Uh, his name was Brendan Walsh. He had a restaurant called Arizona 206. Mm-hmm. It was back then it was a three star restaurant for New York Times, which would be like a Michelin star restaurant today. OK. And that changed my life. He 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 had about 10 women and men on. taking responsibility you're feeding people and you're working for me which i'm a three-star chef for new york times and i have a reputation you cannot let me down and this guy did a great job of coaching us and making men and women out of us and i i owe him a lot a lot and arizona 206 how long did you work there at arizona 206 in new york about two and a half years Mm -hmm. and you know then um I moved to San Francisco, which everybody did in the 80s. You have either you, if you lived in San Francisco, you go to New York. Or if you lived in New York, you got to go to San Francisco because you had to go check out what's going on on the West Coast. What's this Pacific Rim cuisine I hear about or this Southwestern cuisine I hear about? And I went there for a year. I, I worked at Stars Restaurant, which is very known back in the 80s, Jeremiah Tower um was the chef and they just had a piece on him on netflix um and anthony bourdain actually made the movie produced the movie uh for jeremiah tower whatever happened to him and he was huge one of the probably one of the first big celebrity style restaurants Mm -hmm. and i worked there i learned a lot working there and then i moved back to new york and i opened up the second restaurant i've ever been a part of but i was one of the chefs opening it up this time and what was, was the name of the time restaurant cafe. what was it called uh, time cafe time cafe and that was one of the biggest openings for the decade that was in 1990 and you know from there everything took off i realized hey i, I can run 11 million dollar restaurant I can coach 40, 50 people under me. And then it just went from there. And then my, my life just took off from there. Let's talk about your development as a chef. It's interesting that you traveled restaurant to restaurant, city to city to learn. It's almost like a formal but unformal education, like word of mouth, this is where it's hot, this is what I need to do, and this is where I need to go. So you pack up your bags and go. Do you have a family? Do you have a girlfriend? Yeah. How, do you, how do you remain so mobile and yeah, flexible? Yeah, I, I actually was married during this whole time. I got married when I was 23. And it was tough. It was challenging. You know, like, uh, you know, my wife was a stockbroker at the time. Mm-hmm. So, you know... I, it was, it was challenging because, you know, there was a lot of things I wanted to do I couldn't do. But luckily, I did live in New York City. New York City is the mecca mm-hmm. for everything. Art, you know, music, you name it. And food just started blowing up. And it, New York was starting to become a real famous place for food. And so I was lucky that we lived there. I think if I lived anywhere else... I probably got gotten divorced at a really young age. You know what I mean? But I raised my kids doing it. Um, it, was, it wasn't easy. I'll tell you that. Being it, raising a family wasn't easy, but we got through it and we did it. So Not- you're progressing as a chef. You're making all these moves. You're going from D.C. to New York, New York to San Francisco. Is that a normal track for a chef to become established and well-educated? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I skipped one major thing. Mm-hmm. I really should have went to Europe 
and learned under all those chefs. Uh -huh. And I never got to d do that. And I guess I'm kind of living that now, you know, like um, being in the corporate part. I've really been fortunate to work overseas a lot. Um, and, you know, I've lived in some pretty crazy places. I lived in Kenya. You know, uh, um, I've lived all throughout Spain. You Were know, you cooking in Kenya? Yeah, yeah. I was helping a, a business uh, that was there that had a chain of restaurants go from just being in one city to all the cities in Africa. So, wow. um, when you're learning to cook and become a well respected chef and learning the restaurant business, how do you get a job? What, what, how do you go up to a chef and say, Hey, I want a job and you knock on the door and you're in New York or you're going to San Francisco and let's say the French laundry in, uh, Northern California, a kid wants to learn to be a chef. How do you approach a restaurant like that and ask and let alone get on the cook line? Well, if you go up to the restaurant in person mm -hmm. with a resume in hand, I'd be shocked if any really good chef would turn that young person down wow. because you have to have a lot of, we, we call it cojones, mm -hmm. a lot of balls to walk up there and go up to a famous chef and say, I want to work here. That, that means you're not scared. That's the first thing. Because when you work in a restaurant, you're live on stage every day. And that's what it's like. It's live theater. And you can't screw up. You just can't. Because, you know, it's going to look bad. How do, you, how do you cover that up and not let the guests know about that? So that's how you do it, man. I mean, my, 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 my dad wasn't a major influence on me. But the one thing he said, he goes, you go in person, anywhere in life, and show your face and ask the major question what you're looking for, most of the time those people will stop and listen to you. And I have to say, he, he, he's right. I mean, I still do it today. Um, that's awesome. I mean, that's something that I have to do as an attorney is ask for the business, ask for the opportunity, um, and ask um, to be of service so I could help them grow and then help myself grow and help feed my face, so to speak, by earning a living and income. You mentioned that you learned to run an $11 million restaurant. Um, what does it take to run an $11 million restaurant? That was restaurant? 1990. Keep 1990 in, in New York City. In New York, yeah, man. I mean, that was a pretty popular restaurant because today, I mean, that same restaurant, I went back to it 25 years later and – I, I took over a chef that was in that space. Are you talking about Arizona 206 or the one no, that you opened Time up? Cafe. Time Cafe. You opened and, up Time Cafe, right? Yeah, I went back there 25 years later. The original owner of that space still owned it. And he just asked me one day, he goes, hey, do you want to come back here? Wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't this be a great story? And, and that's 25 years later. We were doing $15 million. So 1990, we were doing uh, – 11 million. How was it like? I was 27 years old. I was crazy. Everybody thought I was crazy to do it because mm -hmm. my friend and I, we were so understaffed. You know, today you would have like four young sous chefs under you. It was just myself and the chef. And we, we were open for breakfast, lunch, dinner, brunch, and we had a store. And we just, I mean, I lived there for a year and a half, probably 16 hours minimum a day. Um, it's just because you love doing, I just love being in a kitchen. I love being around all those people. I love the hype. I love 15 minutes right before your opening. You know, you, you have everybody the front and back of the house there and you're pumping them up and getting them all ready with some of the specials and just, you know, the whole thing. It's it's like being a – you were a, a football player. It's its like that. It's right before the game. Everyone's slapping their helmets like, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go out there and be beasts. Same thing. Really? In the kitchen, I thought thing. maybe a restaurant environment was laid back and chill and you just come and you're like chilling. I wouldn't and, want to work that. Really? So it's like <laughs> yeah. a high-pressure environment. 
Nah, man, you got to get pumped up. Because really? 20 minutes before service, the chef comes and checks the line mm-hmm. and tastes everything. And you got to be spot on and ready. So as a young chef or a young cook, that the 20 minutes before service is important. And then if everything's good, you don't have to worry about anything and make any adjustments. You put some food in your body really quick. <laughs> You get your water bottle ready and you put your head down and you basically have two major uh, phases throughout the night. You know, you have your first rush and then you have your second rush and you just got to prepare yourself. You got to be ready and pumped up and ready to go and like doing what you're doing. If you go there and you can see that person's body language is not like everybody else's, that person doesn't last. You can smell it. You can be like... Yeah, that person's probably a couple of weeks and they're out. So when you opened Time Cafe, were you the the proprietor, the owner, or were you just one I was of the two players? I was, I was second in charge uh, with the chef. My friend Don Ensalaco was the chef, and I was her sous chef. And then everybody under us were cooks. And it's a lot because you're the only two responsible ones for the owners opening and closing. So you had to be there all the time. So it was a lot. Walk us through the opening. So you have this idea. A person says, hey, I have this spot. I want to go in the restaurant business. How mm-hmm. do you determine what food you're going to serve, who your clientele are going to be, um, and how you're going to function to serve your clients? Well, everybody does their own type of surveying you know, and marketing. Let's just use 1990. Three guys from graduate school from USC really liked each other. They found themselves in New York City. And they thought, hey, we have a great space here. We have a great deal on the rent because the one, one of the three members was into commercial real estate. And he goes, what if we do something like this with this huge mural of the Mojave Desert that all the guests can see, open air, and we bring California style food to New York City. And that's one way of doing it. You know what I mean? Being influenced by something that's hot. Or you could be with a bunch of owners that are Italian and they're coming from Italy with really successful restaurants and they know there's room in this one particular city for their restaurant. And usually that's how it works or I'm a really hot chef and two people with money, two lawyers like you, lots of money, (laughs) want want to invest and have a second kind of like have a hobby on the side. There's a lot of that in the game. I personally stay away from that. Right. I stay stay away. It's all right if you guys are silent partners, but I I like to work (laughs) – I like to work with people that are in the business to be honest with you because Mm -hmm. they – they understand what it takes, you know what I mean? And then they'll give the chef proper amount of time to prepare the opening. Now, it sounds like of- that, that's a difference between a corporate kind of restaurant where you have investors and they're trying to flip a buck, and then you have a a real um, artist, a proprietor who is a trained yeah. chef and interested in the food and delivering and creating a great experience and earning income. And then the corporate style where I'm not going to name any names, but they're, they're more interested in turning a profit while delivering a service as, as opposed to creating an experience. Is that, is that accurate? It's kind of accurate. The, the one thing you said, corporate, a lot of people don't understand really what it means. I, I definitely understand it more than ever because I've been on that level plenty now. Um, you could still be an artist. You could still do what you want. But there's one thing. If you don't have in common, corporate or not, you have to make money or you're not going to be that artist. In the early days, it didn't work for a lot of big-headed chefs that just wanted the art. Nowadays, everybody is slowly, and they always say this, well, I got the corporate mentality now in me, so I can really feel comfortable now about my art. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't call that corporate. You know what corporate is to me? Is you have investment groups, you have real estate groups, you have a few owners, 
And then you have the operator. That's corporate because I haven't even gotten to the chef yet. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or the, the wine sommelier or any of that. That's corporate when you have a lot of people above your head and you have to follow those P&Ls. If you're not on top of it and, oh, wow, this week, it looks like we're, we're trending in the wrong area, man. Payroll's way up. And if you're not in the industry and you don't understand, well, payroll's up for everybody Monday through Wednesday, but from Thursday to Sunday, it goes down. Relax. It goes down because that's when the volume of business comes in. So I would, I would say that's corporate when you have all those people above your head. I mean, hey, look, let's just use French laundry, right? Mm-hmm. Some people may say that's corporate because Thomas Keller has a lot of money behind him. But he didn't get there with all that money. So I would say he's not corporate at all. Right. You know, he because he controls it. Jose Andres, in, he's in D.C. People say he's corporate. He's not corporate at all. Because if it doesn't go his way, Jose will pull out. He doesn't care if there's millions and millions and millions of dollars on the table. If it doesn't go his way, he pulls out. And he controls the destiny but 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 he has that understanding it's got to make money you know what i mean thanks for listening to attorneyknowsbest.com if you hadn't heard i'm using anchor.fm to record this podcast anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast let me explain first anchor.fm is free that's right totally free There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. I listen to my podcasts on Google Podcasts. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app now or Go to anchor.fm to get started. That's A-N-C-H-O-R dot F-M to get started. Back to the podcast. Thanks for listening. Is a chef the most important thing in the restaurant or is the experience? Or are they separate? Total experience. Total experience. Total experience. That is, that's an excellent question. Honestly, that's probably a question a lot of people don't ask chefs. And I would have to be a a pretty big headed person just to say the chef. It's the experience from the, from everyone says the same thing too, who knows what they're talking about from when you open that door and when you leave that door, Mm -hmm. every second counts. If I didn't open that door from you, when you open, when you came in and I didn't open that door for when you left, you already have a couple strikes against me. So that's the experience. If the service was great and the food was okay, that's the experience, right? Um, if the food was great and everything I just listed before was terrible, you know what I mean? It goes back to experience. So I'd have to say the full experience. Good question. I've been to, I think, I don't know if it was a, it, it had a couple of stars, but it was a restaurant in Pennsylvania at a resort called Le Trec or something like named after Toulouse the truck. Mm-hmm. And it was an, it was the best, one of the best restaurant experiences I've ever had. And it, I think it had a Michelin star and you were right. They waited on us hand and foot. And then, then I asked the, um, the mater D or the person that was working the floor and looked like he was controlling everybody uh, with regards to delivering service. And I asked him what was the most important thing uh, in maintaining his Michelin star, he said the experience and communicating everything clearly to the customer and anticipating what they want before they ask for it and making sure you get it to them perfectly. It was really a, an amazing experience. And, you know, you know it's, it, it's funny because you're in a restaurant like that. If I was in a restaurant like that, knowing what I know, mm-hmm. we would in the early days, this is when I was younger, I'd be like, Hey, I go to my wife, just drop your fork really quick, accidentally. And that's a sure test. Is everybody paying attention? 
And if you drop wow. that fork and you have more than one eye on it, oh my God, you're like, okay, we're in for a good experience. Really? So yeah, that and go to the bathroom right away. Check out the bathrooms. Bathrooms uh-huh. say it all. Mm-hmm. Say it all. Wow. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, this, there's a, a really good restaurant tour in D.C. And I'll mention her name because I personally think she's probably one of the best people to uh, run a restaurant because she knows she knew nothing about it when she got into it. She just has a great personality. Her name's Rose. She has a restaurant called Compass Rose and the second one called Madan. And she's exactly that. You know, she's exactly that. It's all about just the guest. It's all about giving them an experience. Her belief is, I want people to come here and just get away for two hours Mm -hmm. and just be themselves, not be themselves, and just enjoy it. And that's a good restaurant owner. And her big thing was, I remember when we were building her place out because she hired me to help create the concepts she goes the bathrooms are everything john paul the bathrooms are everything she just kept saying it every day too how are the bathrooms i was like bathrooms are looking good we, we used to have bathroom check every 15 minutes 15 they minutes be, wow oh yeah yeah they got to be great because it's a big part of the restaurant everyone may not think about let me ask you this when you go to a restaurant how many times do you go to the bathroom or What's your chance of going to a bathroom in a restaurant when you go to the restaurant? It depends on what I'm there for. If I'm there for a a great dining experience and I know I'm going to spend two hours or more there, I'm going to get an appetizer. I'm going to get maybe two appetizers, two courses, three courses, four courses. I'm going to maybe go once or twice, once to begin so I don't have to get up during the meal. And then – after one of the courses, maybe once or twice. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So you, you just visited a, a zone that there's not many people in there. So you got to make sure that zone is covered. That's a good restaurant owner. You know what I mean? It, it focuses on those little things. Like the example, front door, the front door. Is there any debris in the front door? Is there, it's fall time, the wind's out, all the stuff's there. Make sure the front door is cleaned up and so people can walk in without feeling uncomfortable. All those little things matter. So, yeah, going back to your question, it's all about the experience, man. Mm-hmm. It really is. When someone's looking to get in the restaurant experience, is location and decor of their space important or is the food more important? Balancing the experience, can the food overcome the decor and ambiance or can the ambiance overcome the food or you have to balance them out. So like there's these popular shows, diners, drive-ins and dives. Right. And some of the places I go, oh, I don't know if I can enjoy the food <laughs> there because of how it looks. Um, I have to say if, if you know what you're going in there for, you, then you're good. Like n- normally dives, I prefer not to eat at the dive. I'd rather just get it and leave because I know they're good for something. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a good question just because, you know, you can't open an Italian restaurant in a Chinese neighborhood or something like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's probably not going to go well because they just want Chinese food, man. That's it. Right. I, I mean, that's being ignorant. I don't want to be sound ignorant, but you know what I'm saying? I know like, what you're saying. You you don't want to do that. Like, let's use Olney, Maryland, right? I love Olney. It's, it used to be great farmland. A lot of different nationalities live there. It's a quite interesting area of Maryland. Um, so people started opening Belgium restaurants there, and then because there's a Belgian community, and then the no Americans, idea. then the Americans were like, "What's this? What's this all about?" And they realize, wow, this is great. This is a Belgian restaurant in our area. We can say we have a Belgian restaurant. And Belgian restaurants basically are mussels and chips. You know? Yeah, I, that's you what know? I had. We met mussels and chips. And I was like, Belgium yeah. has mussels? Yeah. So they did their homework. They did some surveying. Um, surveying's everything. Uh, you know, you, you don't put a pizzeria on a block that there's four other pizzerias. Here's a good example. COVID hit. 
I'm on 84th Street and 2nd Avenue. That's where I lived. Only one pizzeria in 10 blocks survived after a month. By April, only one of those were open out of maybe 20. There was only one pizzeria open. That's wow. it. Wow. Was you know it because what I mean? Like, was it was their quality better, their service better, or they just had no? It was it, to be honest with you? Excuse my language. It was a shitty pizzeria. Mm-hmm. Like my favorite one that did Romano style pizza closed. It's just you know what it is. There, maybe their delivery was faster than everybody else's, and they just I don't know what it was, but they were the only ones that gutted it out. Maybe they weren't making a dime, and they just thought let's just stay open anyhow. Um, and then they reap the benefit because everybody else, they played that game. Let, let's wait for everybody else to close. But normally, if you have that many pizzerias in a, in a 10 square block area in New York City, they don't last that long. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't. They just don't. And it's usually the ones that try to be fancy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, people are just going to the pizzeria for a greasy slice of pizza. Slice. Yeah. yeah, they hold it up like this and drip some of the oil and eat it, you know? So one of the things I love about the restaurant industry are the stories that you help create and the roles you play in people's lives. Let's face it, a lot of people go to a restaurant to celebrate an event. They go to a restaurant to make a connection, start a relationship. What's your favorite restaurant story? Oof. I've had a lot of weird and fun ones with presidents to shootings. Shootings. Being held up. Well, oh, let's, yeah, being let's, held up in service. Let, let's talk about presidents. I, You've had an opportunity to cook for a president or serve a president? Well, wait a minute. I, I, this is, but that's not that exciting. They, they're, they're that's not that exciting? Because, no, because they got all this Secret Service people in the kitchen, they're tasting your food, and you're like, dude, get get your hands out the of the Secret food. Service is actually there tasting the food. Oh, yeah. And watching you cook it. Yeah, I remember Nancy Reagan used to come in all the time for lunch at, at Nora's. Uh-huh. And I knew I knew the Secret Service dude's name by first, you know, that by first name. Um, I would just, I, I just told him nicely, just don't put your hands in stuff. I will give, <laughs> I, I'll give you everything that I'm going to serve her. And he has to see the ticket. You got to make sure it's the right table and the right position number where she's sitting. And I'd have to give him basically what I'm giving her exactly the same plate. I would give Nancy, I would give him and he would watch me make it. I would give him the plate and like, take this one out quick. And the secret service guy would eat the other one. Wow. That's one thing. Would they pay for but the other my one? Favorite, my <laughs> favorite they... story, though, I have to share this with you. Okay. And, and it's Black History Month, too. And this is even the best. <laughs> the best. This is Time Cafe, and I'm, I'll go back to the restaurant I was mentioning before. Do you know Def Jam? You know. Yeah, okay, I Def know Jam? rap. I mean, although my voice sounds square and I dress like a corporate guy, I know rap really well. Well, Def Jam was made up of. of of Russell Simmons and a few people, right? Rick Rubin, um, Russell Simmons. Yeah. Rick Rubin. Well, our restaurant was kind of like the meeting ground for Def Jam Records. Whoa. So, oh yeah, that corner table, man, right underneath the Mojave Desert uh, picture, that table was full of, I can, not, I can go on all day from Denzel Washington's to the Madonna's to Living Color, Beastie Boy's, you know, all, I can go on forever. All those people would sit, sit at that table. A young Puff Daddy. Nobody knew who he was. You know, all those kind of people. And that was exciting because 20 years later, 25 years later, I was meeting up with the owners of that space. And we were like, God, we need to write a book about a history of all the restaurants we've opened in New York. I was like, especially Time Cafe. We were there for the creation of Def Jam Records. That's huge. That's that's as big as Motown, you know? Right. And we we all stopped and we were like, you're right. And we also had a nightclub underneath there called Sticky Frogs Mike, uh, Sticky Frogs, Sticky Mike's Frog Bar, which turned into Fez. Um, And we used to house Mingus Jazz Band used to be there every Wednesday night. Johnny Cash played there. You know, stuff like that. But I have to say, 
the Def Jam Records thing to me was the coolest thing ever because I'm a big music guy and like you know any any stories any beefs because you know East Coast West Coast rap rivalry and the bravado of rap and the rivalries and any any showdowns you know, you, at the restaurant be, yeah back in those days it was like there was a rival there's no doubt about it I lived in Brooklyn too and there's definitely a rival because. Um, but it was a friendly rival. Like they, you know, they wanted like, you know, the gurus and the, 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 um, uh, I'm going to forget all the names of the guys from Queens, but all these guys, big daddy Kane, all those guys, they would welcome all the LA rappers. They liked it. There was a rival, but it was a friendly rival because they liked what each one was doing. That's at least what I got. The impression mm-hmm. I got, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't that deep into it. You know, I, I just thought it was cool because I liked all the music that was coming in there, hanging out at that table. So for right. me, I loved it. And I, this is coming from a kid in the 70s that was pure, you know, rock and roll, you know, and, and pure rock and roll, but funk. I grew up in a town where Parliament was created, where George Clinton, Plainfield, New Jersey. So I got... Music was huge, man. Music's very big for chefs too. You know, why is that? You think? Chef, why do you think huh? that is? Why do you think that is the music restaurant connection? Why do you think that is? Entertainment, man. We're entertainers. So We're chef entertainers. is an entertainer. Wow. Yeah, We're entertainers. Mm-hmm. I remember back in the day, a lot of people would be like, "Hey, man, we want to steal your chef or your sous chef. I want him as a private chef." I remember Eddie Murphy was looking around town. And he took one of the cooks at Arizona 206. We're lucky today. This is all the places I've mentioned. Right. Took this cook. She was a daytime. I remember she was on saute. I forgot her name. But she took her. And I remember she went to go be Eddie's uh, private chef back in the late 80s. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, was, that, that was one thing. Poaching chefs back in the day. Were you ever poached? Were you ever a private chef or someone? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I was poached by all the Upper East Side uh, cougars, all those ladies, because <laughs> they like talking to me. I was in an outside kitchen, and so I remember. You can can this you mention lady. any names? Or you got to keep it private. <laughs> oh no, her name's Marianne Quinson. She was the goddaughter of Bergman Goodman, mm-hmm. who owned Bergman Goodman's, and she was a. She was an aristocrat. She was a New Yorker, a real New Yorker. So Bergman Goodman's was a department store, right? A department yeah. store. Okay. And she was a beautiful person because all her money, everything she made went to went to uh, poverty-stricken areas or people that needed help, stuff like that. She was really a cool woman. And I used to do a lot of private events for her. And when I was there doing events, all her friends would try to steal me. And she did not like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she would come in the back and she'd be like did veronica just come up and t-? she was talking to you wasn't she i was like yeah, yeah, yeah. what is she talking about no nothing 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 she wants you to come over to her house and cook for her. i tell her no i was like hey nobody owns me but <laughs> it, it was like that for a while um mm-hmm. and then you know nowadays it's different now it's like oh you want thomas keller well you're gonna have to pay him just 15 grand just to talk to him for the day. And you got to so, go through his agent, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I worked for one of them, Jose Andres. Okay. And I remember, oh, yeah, back in the early days, I remember just to talk to Jose was like five grand, you know? Just, wow. Yeah. But Jose wouldn't, Jose would give you a ton of time. I mean, if you were going to spend money on a chef, I'd say that's one guy I would spend money on because mm-hmm. he'll give you every ounce. Right. So you, you worked with Jose Andres. Yeah. It was a really, and later in my career, yeah. yeah. And what role did you play with uh, Jose Andres when you worked with him? Well, he he knew my sister-in-law, Nora, from Restaurant Nora. And I was telling my sister-in-law, I was, this is the second time I went back to go work for them. This was in the early 2000s. I said, I, I got to leave here. I got to go look for a bigger name chef, somebody to work for so I can grow. I want to run some restaurants, not just one. I want to get into this whole movement of 
That's interesting you know, that you would leave family. Were there any hard feelings when you'd say, I'm no, leaving no, you guys, no. you got my, me started? My, bro- my brothers hate it when the chef stayed there more than two years. They, they liked having new blood in there all the time. So for me, they, I was their brother. They were like, yeah, John Paul's going to be bored working for us. There's no, there's no growth here, really. And, and she turned me on to Jose. I went and met him. And he was telling me what he was going to be doing. And he was telling me, he was mapping me out his life. And he, he was, a lot of the things he mentioned that are going on today, he mentioned to me 15, 16 years ago, not just me, a lot of the chefs that work for him. But he brought me in to take over his job, really, of running all the Haleos and the rest. Oh, Haleos. How about the one in Bethesda? That, I, I went there many, many yeah. years ago. Oh, that was my headquarters there. Was that the first and, one? No, the first one's in D.C., okay. on 7th Street. Okay. And then the second one was Bethesda. The third was Crystal City. And then there's more today. There's one in Disney Springs. and uh, mm-hmm. yeah. But he hired me to basically take over his job because he knew he was going worldwide in public. And that's when he became Jose Andres all around the globe. And then he hi- he basically hired a Delta Force team of people like me to take over all his responsibilities. Because when I came to him, he already owned with Rob Wilder, both of them, and Roberto Alvarez. That was the threesome. They owned Cafe Atlantico, Zetinia, Oymel, and all the Haleos, and then the mini bar. So they already owned a bunch of stuff. So he they knew he was going to blow up. So he started creating this Delta force team of, you know, chefs that could deal with multi units and stuff like that. And none of us knew what we were doing. So we were both training each other. He, he couldn't be a more like likable dude to work for, but demanding big time. But I was used to demanding by then. I was already in my forties. So I could, I could get slapped around a little bit and not cry. Mm-hmm. A lot, a lot of young chefs cry and they want to quit when somebody gets <laughs> them. I think, I think I have that issue too in running my my firm. Believe it or not, sometimes <laughs> I, I, I they don't cry because I'm not really a slave driver, like hard, hard. But I am demanding, and sometimes I have to tell them I'm the guy who's getting the work. You do the work, and just because you do more than me physically doesn't mean you do more than me because I have all the burden of risk. And I'm writing a check. And so sometimes people, sometimes like in a in an ownership relationship, people think that because they're doing more physical labor than you, they have more a role or responsibility, but they really don't. Because the guy who's taking the brunt of the risk has all the stress. Explain how you control a young, ambitious chef and manage them and let them know that your job in managing them is just as important as their job in, in, in flipping eggs. Dude, that's a beautiful segue, by the way. I must say, you're, you're good at this. <laughs> that's a great segue. It's, you, you just said it. You said the whole thing. Mm-hmm. You, when, you have, it's, when you're a chef and then you're young cooks is one thing. When you're a multi-unit chef mm-hmm. and then you're dealing with the chefs and the chefs underneath them, that's when you really see the people who are on your team are worth it because if if they're going to be jealous of you because you have that job you're traveling around and all that they don't understand you're the one taking the grunt you don't have the investment investors on your ass you don't have the owners on you you don't have the realtors on you you're that one taking all the grunt and they get to play in a kitchen and, and be inventive but you're taking all the grunt so, yeah, I mean, you just said it. You said it perfectly. It's exactly the same thing, mm-hmm. same thing. And you have to just create a good atmosphere where they don't feel that way. You know, um, I, I would always tell them, I wish I was with you right now in the kitchen because jumping on an airplane in four hours, it's not that fun. It's not, everyone thinks it's fun to travel to multiple cities. It isn't. It's not tangible. And when you're a cook, you're touching and tasting everything. And then when that gets taken away from you and you got to be the lead person to take the grunt of everything. Yeah. You know, you want to have a team of people that once was you. So what you were just saying, you could easily say right back to your workers, be like, Hey, look, I was you. 
I was you at one point. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, some I always like tell them, I tell them, I licked envelopes, weighed the envelopes, vacuumed the floor, took out the trash, yeah. answered the phone, returned the call, was here on a Sunday, you know. Okay. Here's a good thing. <laughs> Here's COVID, right? It's not mm-hmm. a good thing, right? And I was going back to your original questions. Well, guess what? I'm going back to the very beginning. I'm going to open up a barbecue joint and guess how many workers are going to be working there? 20. Two. 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 Myself and some of the work the front of the house. Mm-hmm. And when you cook slow cook barbecue over wood, that's 12 hours before the product's even done. And then you got to serve it. Mm-hmm. So I'm going back to those because of COVID. That's, that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. So instead of going back to the corporate world or being a multi-unit chef, I realize those jobs are gone now or they pay a lot less. So I can't do that and afford to do that job. So I figured, you know what? I'm going all the way back to the beginning. I'm going to start all over again and hone in on my art. And I'm going to cook some incredible slow cooked barbecue and, and other stuff. And yeah, that's what it is. So I'm going back to where your workers are. You could tell your workers my story. Maybe that'll humble them. Because <laughs> I'm not scared to, to clean up all the dirt I made all day. I mm-hmm. have to clean up. I don't have a cleaning crew. Guess who's going to have to clean at the end of the day? Mm-hmm. Me. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And cleaning a kitchen, especially with wood smoke, you know, there's a lot to clean at the end of the day. So, right, right. <laughs> well, how are you bouncing back in COVID? I mean, there's not a lot of investors. You probably don't have like copious amounts of capital. Is it just going to be on a handshake and your word to perform or, or it, 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 like with your vendors? I mean, that that's a whole nother yeah. story is like, where do you get the food? How do you get the food? Will they deliver it? Do they trust you? How do you pay the vendors? Like you're, where are you starting from now in this new venture? Uh, I mean, um, you lost your job during COVID-19, right? Yep. Yep. And so you've been trying to get back employed. You can't find work. So now you're going to go out on your own. How do you it, do that? It, it, it happened on a whim. It mm-hmm. was really weird. It's two people that just ran into each other on a phone call. And he's an organic farmer. Okay. And he's been, he needs to make more money for his family. His, he has kids, three kids under eight. And he told me this idea he had. And he said he had a little bit of money to back it. So we built a, a, a P&L together. And we looked at some numbers for a year or two. And we built it on a very humble and honest number system with just a few people working it. And we realized we could do it. And I thought, you know what? We're not going to be able to get the money. We're not going to get the volume of people spending all this money to to go out to restaurants. So this makes a lot of sense. Plus, we could sell it retail and wholesale as well, our product, other than coming to this little barbecue pit. And that's how I did it. I just used my knowledge, and I'm playing it safe. I'll be honest with you. Playing it safe. I won't make a lot of money. I'll be able to pay my bills, which is good. And that's it. And then the hope is... We can expand it and sell it in stores all all throughout the area where we're going to do it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. It takes gumption. Have you ever written anything down, a step-by-step guide for someone to open their restaurant and how to be successful in the restaurant business? Because with your, what, 35, 40 years of experience, I'm sure uh, that would be an asset to someone. It would, wouldn't it? It's mm-hmm. like they can get it for themselves. Tell them to learn on their own. <laughs> I'm not giving <laughs> I've worked my butt off long enough. I'm not going to share that part. No. Well, Only you're doing sure. a good job sharing now. I think no, people I will share. be able to. Yeah. I, I believe in sharing. You share your knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. The, the only way to get your workers to work for you, you, you teach them everything you know, even the dishwasher. You want to know how much money we spent today on payroll? Look, I would show the dishwashers everything because I love them. They're the most important job in the restaurant. So I would, I would bring them in to chef meetings Once a week, when I would have multi-unit chef meetings, I'd be like, hey, bring so-and-so over. Let's have them be part of the meeting today because I want them to learn the business. And they would appreciate stuff like that. Um, Now, I'd be the worst person to write something on because I go all over the place. I'm kind of spastic. But no, 
No, I wouldn't because I, I wouldn't want the responsibility of someone failing because of me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you got to look at failure. Um, I think you have to look at failure uh, in a certain way that as long as you've served your clients and your guests appropriately and they had an excellent experience, um, I think that's – and you created memory for them right? You, a, a lifelong lasting memory and gave them an excellent meal. I think that's a success, but the restaurant could fail. You could be serving great food and the restaurant fails, but I don't think it's a failure, so to speak, because you, you yeah. created an experience for someone and you, you did one of the most important things you could do for a human is feed them. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, and I, you just said something really important, mm-hmm. feeding them today's environment after COVID, whenever after COVID is, People have to be really humble now and start feeding people Mm -hmm. and feeding good food and giving better prices. And restaurants, if they're going to survive, they have to be that. They have to welcome everybody in now. A lot of people who have little money are as savvy as the person that has money that knows about food. And you got to offer that to everybody. And the world needs to be friendlier and more open door policy towards everybody and make it affordable for people, not just a certain class of people. That's something I always stayed away from. I didn't like the upper echelon. I don't want to entertain them every day. That's boring. I I want to see people. Mm -hmm. And the perfect example of a restaurant like that in your area is Compass Rose in Madan. They're the perfect. You'll see pe- you'll see President Obama's in there all the time. Michelle and Obama are in Madan all the time. How do you spell Madan? M A Y D A N. Okay. It's on it's on Florida Avenue, right off of um, Florida and W. I'm gonna have to take my kids, my wife and kids there. Oh, entertaining! You got it. Okay. You're on the fire. You're literally on the fire watching your food being cooked. It's awesome. Wow. And but she does it right. Her doors are open to everybody. And you look at the workers in there, and she's not handpicking them. They're coming to her because they know she's cool. Like when we first opened Compass Rose, I don't think there was any white people working in that kitchen or the front of the house. They were from all sorts of lands all over the globe, from Russia to, uh, you know, uh, this uh, Ethiopia to uh, all over the place. We had all... Just because it's the vibe. She gives out a vibe where she just wants everybody to come into her home and see what she's offering. And I think that's beautiful. That's, it. That, that's community. And restaurants equals community. And we have to give back to the community. Jose Andres does it the best. Right. He created World Kitchen. I mean, he's, he's, he's sucking up all the people he knows that have money. And he's saying, cough it up, man. Cough it up because we got to feed the people. And he's getting people that would never coughed up that kind of money to help support him. To There's World Central Kitchens in almost every city in the, in the world now. Wow. You know, it's wild. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, community equals restaurants equals community. If you were going to give someone advice and uh, a young kid or young adult, who aspires to be in the restaurant industry, um, what three tidbits of advice would you give them? Don't be afraid of failure because you're going to do, you fail all the time. It's the only way you're going to learn. After a year, come back, revisit it, and really soul search and say, is this what you want to do? Because you do put in a lot of time. I mean, The average cook works 50 hours a week. So you have to remember that. And then the third thing is, do you love it? Don't, if you don't love it, then don't do it. I mean, you know, ask, ask your musician, do you love doing what you're doing? They're going to say yes, or they're not going to say no. Ask Tom Brady. Do you like being a quarterback? He's going to be like, yeah, Yeah. I'm 45 years old. What do you think? (laughs) As much as I love him, but I hate him as an athlete because he's not on my team. Yeah. But, uh, you know what I mean? It's like that. So those are the three things. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's great. Uh, I love restaurants. I love to eat. Um, my dad, uh, we were a middle-class family 
And but my dad. Where did loved, you grow up? I grew up in Southern California, off a military ah. base. My dad was an adventurer. He he was from a small town in West Virginia. He graduated high school, I think, on a Tuesday. And on a Friday or Thursday, he left for the United States Air Force. And one of the first places that he was stationed was in Japan. So my dad loved Japanese food. And he would leave the base and go out on his own for, like, during his leave time when he was in Japan and just go explore Japan and make friends in Japan and eat Japanese food and go wherever he wanted in Japan. And so when we were growing up on our base, my dad would take us to little hole in the wall Japanese restaurants that you know probably some GI and his wife set up, and we'd go eat there. He, we'd go to a. T- he was stationed in Vietnam during the Vietnam War, two tours. We'd go to Vietnamese restaurant, Thai restaurant, and eat everything and anything. So I grew up eating. We didn't have. We had a nice middle class house. We didn't do many vacations, but we ate well. I could have. I could have a T-bone steak in the morning and eggs every day of the week if I wanted because my dad valued food that much. And That's so, awesome. Yeah, so when I, go, when I would go to uh, recruiting trips for college football and they would take me to some fa- fancy restaurant and say, oh, yeah, we're having a steak. We're having a T-bone steak. We're having filet. And I would just say, oh, okay. And they go, you don't look excited. And I didn't realize that not everybody grew up being able to yeah. eat steak <laughs> and eggs anytime you wanted during my, because my dad highly valued food. And I didn't really have fine dining experiences growing up. I grew up in a middle class small town called uh, Marino Valley, California, about 60 miles southwest, I mean, southeast of LA, 30 minutes uh, north of Palm Springs. But we never went to Palm Springs. We only went to like, you know, dine in quick serve Denny's diner kind of restaurants but when there's came, nothing out there man doing that <laughs> drive from Palm Springs to LA is like nothing it used to be nothing now it's like a wall to wall houses it's pretty sad yeah. it, it, the nothing looked better than houses do you have houses. a curve on good authentic Thai and Japanese food I bet you ate some really good stuff oh yeah I mean I ate great stuff I mean uh, there was a, a Thai restaurant uh, called Gordo's and basically they took over a little like a hut style a frame roof restaurant where they had amazing American breakfast but then at night they had a blend of Thai food and um, American standard cuisine and our favorite meals there my brother's favorite meal was beef with oyster sauce and then my favorite meal was the Thai omelet which was a uh, an, an egg omelet with um, onions and scallions in it, but then it had either chicken or stir fried vegetables in the middle and with, with their sticky rice. And that was our favorite meal. And then there was a Japanese restaurant. My favorite meal in, in Japan is katsudon, which is a fried pork cutlet over yeah. rice with this sauce. And it's just, you, you know, that's, you a, it. that's a popular, that is th- right before COVID. Uh-huh. That was a very trendy sandwich. Really? Katsudon? Oh, yeah. The fried I pork? I love that. Yeah, and it's just amazing. I had a Japanese girlfriend uh, when I lived in L.A., and she was shocked that I knew what katsudon was, and I loved to eat it. It was like a the pork cutlet, but with a raw egg cut, cracked over the top of it, and then the heat of the rice and the pork cutlet cook the egg, and you eat it together. It's amazing. But, wow. yeah, so, so growing up in Southern California, we had, like, I didn't realize how good the produce was in the grocery stores like the stuff you could actually get yeah. in the grocery stores. But I really didn't have fine dining experiences until I came to the East Coast uh, and went to University of Maryland, got a chance to go to D.C., and then I had some nice friends who were, you know, D.C. is funny because there's a lot of affluent African-American people, but you wouldn't know it because they fake like they're not. But they took me to some amazing restaurants in D.C., and I didn't even understand or comprehend how good the quality of the food was or the service was because I was always used to eating quality food but not prepared how they prepared it here in D.C. and not the ambience or the experience right. or the exquisite service that we received from the uh, the restaurant team. But, yeah, so food is important to me. My wife is an amazing cook. She's amazing. We'd be best friends with you. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I love food. My kids are nine and 11 and they make gourmet desserts my son just made a german chocolate cake this weekend for uh our friend's super bowl party and my daughter made a a a chocolate cheesecake 
Oreo chocolate cheesecake and they're nine and they love to cook. And they're See, that's there. great because mm-hmm. when they become young adults, because my kids are young adults in their late 20s and mid 20s, I never knew they even watched me, to be honest with you, when I was in the house cooking and everything because there was always like a rock show when i'm in the house cooking like we're rocking the music my kids played music so i'm listening to their music i'm cooking and then there's food all over the table and we come and chow and we always had parties and i never thought they would really watch me or they come to the restaurants where i work and then i now i watch they're like awesome cooks like i surprisingly really good cooks and i think that's what's going to happen to your kids they're going to they're going to know how to go grocery shopping and spend their money and, and realize, oh, I could just make that. I don't need to buy a pre-made something. That's, make that's funny that you say that because I went grocery shopping with my daughter on Friday, uh, no, Saturday, to get the ingredients for, for their, um, their desserts that they were going to be making from scratch. We don't even help them, John Paul. They do it all themselves. We might nice. help them clean up, but they do everything themselves. And... My daughter found all the ingredients on the list, and I said, how do you know how to do this? And she goes, "She goes, I've been shopping with mommy since I'm three. <laughs> 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 then we go to the, the checkout line. She bagged all the groceries, and I said, Leah, how do you know how to bag all these groceries perfectly? And she looks at me. She said, Daddy, I told you I've been shopping with mommy since I'm three. So <laughs> <laughs> they love to cook. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, yep. So in closing, John Paul, when you open your restaurant and you're recovering from COVID, why should people come and enjoy what you have to offer? It's, it's going to be an oasis for them to get away from whatever they're dealing with during the day. I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, I just want people to come and eat delicious food, sustainable food. And at a value price where hopefully they come a couple times during the week other than once a month. Mm-hmm. Um, that's exactly the reason why I'm doing it. Um, that's awesome. I want, I want people to forget COVID. Let's just put it that way. Yep, that's great. If people wanted to contact you on Facebook or Twitter, are you available there? Um, I don't do Twitter or Facebook. I, I'm, I'm an Instagram person. Okay. So how would they contact you on Instagram? Just look at my full name, John Paul D'Amato. All right. And it's on, I'm on Instagram. Stay tuned for Lena, the barbecue joint somewhere in the world. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Any question you want to ask me? I always like to give my guests an opportunity to ask me a couple of questions because I'm always the one pushing the envelope with the questions. Sure. Um I, this is a question I asked my uh, my friend who has a podcast called Drinking on the Job. He's a wine he's a wine sales he's not a salesman he's a he's a an expert wine rep in New York City and he started this his podcast. And I have another friend that does one as well, and I asked him the same question. I'm like, what are you? What is your main objective for doing the podcast? Is it for possibly? You've always wanted to be in entertainment and been an interviewer, or is it just that you like people and you're curious about what people are doing? Well, number one, I always wanted to be in radio, television, film, but I let people scare me. And, you know, you gave a tidbit of advice. It's like, don't be scared. Shit. When, <laughs> excuse my language. When I was in college and after college, all I had, all I had were people scaring me all the time. You know, tell me, tell me I'm not good enough. It's a hard business. There's a lot of failure, right? But what I've come to learn, I'm 50 now, right? Everything is hard. There's always going to be the, the, the chance for you to fail. And just because someone else failed doesn't mean you have to fail, especially if you're allowed to learn from their failure so you don't. So I always want to be in radio, television, film. Second, I love people. Third, I love to ask questions. Uh, my wife did a, um, my my 50th birthday was during this COVID-19 crisis. Didn't have a chance to do a party, but my wife did this amazing thing for me. She had uh, very meaningful friends in my life do like a video blurb and send it to me. And one of my friends by the name of Ken Childs, he said, yeah, Sean's always been an interesting brother ever since I've known him in elementary school in Moreno Valley, California. 
Um, he's always asked weird and quirky questions, and he's not scared to ask anybody a question at any time about anything, even if you think it's off topic, but it's on topic to him. So I love asking questions. And being an attorney, it has trained me to ask questions. It's trained me to listen, follow up, and it's also enhanced my ability to understand and like people and want to give people the opportunity and platform to share the knowledge that they have. Uh, I've been told by people when I go to a cocktail party is like, man, you just asked me a hundred questions. I don't know anything about you. Why'd you ask me so <laughs> many questions? And I always say, Hey, I think what you do is really important. You were here for a reason. And the reason why we're crossing paths is because you have probably something special to offer and I have something special to offer in asking questions. And so I'd like to learn about you. And um, I think what you have to offer is special. And your experience, John Paul, in the restaurant industry and your successes uh, and the information you're willing to share is going to help somebody else be successful in the business and help feed people and help create a meaningful experience in their life. So I do it for a number of reasons. Also, I mean, uh, depositions and asking questions at trial, I could go all day. <laughs> <laughs> all day it, asking questions. Do, does this show help you professionally as well? I think you were saying that. I don't know if it helps me professionally or not. Um, I would hope it would, but uh, I don't know. I mean, sometimes, you know, the way the world views lawyers, they pigeonhole us into being these like robot detectives um, not empathetic, very, very much so not sympathetic people. Um, so I don't know if it'll help me or not, but that's not my goal. My goal is to have fun, help other people share the knowledge and information that they have. And then, uh, while helping you share the knowledge and information that you have, maybe it'll help me. I mean, it's my hope that it would help me as well as help other people. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. You're an excellent interviewer. I mean, oh, thanks. You are. You, you ask great questions. I appreciate thanks it, for, John Paul. Thanks for thanks. having me on the show. Hey, man, stay healthy, stay happy, continue to feed people, and uh, continue, uh, continued future success. Will do, sir. All Absolutely. Right. Thanks so much, John Paul. Thank you. Have a great weekend. You too. Attorney knows best. Intelligent questions Interesting